And where do you want to start? There are so many rather dramatic uh, moments in that career with that band. Yeah, I lived it. My musical assault and as, as my life, it, that's what it was. It was Led Zeppelin. Good evening. We were really hot. Sometimes we were on fire. philosophical about it but you know it's 30 years later 25 years later I haven't got time to think of it like that I just think it was amazing it was so exciting you know it's such a such a, 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 a joy to be able to play like that you know be thundering a lot one minute and then stop and it would be like suspended and then come down to a whisper and cra crash and the riffs appear and Robert could go to the microphone and start singing and, all, and, and, and there'd be a riff Good musicians, and so we knew the value of dynamic and light and shade, you know, to set one off against the other, uh, which is why we didn't sound like other bands, because other bands seem to just do light or shade. <laughs> never, never can see me. first album came out and, and, and we got, the door started to open in America and we kicked it down and went in and we toured and we toured and we toured. The first show was December the 26th, 1968 and I don't think the record was out then, I think. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't, but we were like, we were on a show with the Vanilla Fudge Taj Mahal plus Support Act, and that was us, the Support Act. And it was quite a thing to start playing in the States. I was just 20 years old. I think the thing is that on those shows, if there were three bands on, we probably played for an hour, you know, at that time. And what we, the damage that we could do in an hour musically was, it was like, the audience was exhausted at the end of it, and so were we. As time went on, we ended up top of the bill very rapidly. Favorite. I have lots of favourites, all for different reasons. I'm really quite keen on, on, on all of it. Every day there's a different song, every hour, but I mean, I guess if, if I think about what Led Zeppelin were trying to do, I'd go to an album which was really the least popular and the least successful called Presence. And from that there was a track called Achilles' Last Stand. Not quite so keen on In Through the Outdoor because I, I, I sort of felt that that was getting a little bit more structured than the stuff before, which had a real raw edge and freedom to it. But things like what is and what should never be is 
It's really good. The way the, the rhythm comes and the drums come in. When the drums come in, it's magic. I suddenly... To what castle I would take you Well, what's to be the same But one thing is to play, Jimmy, another thing is to record and to capture a sound mm. which you did, like, uh, for example, the drum sound. Yeah. Rock and roll never sounded the same after the Yeah. The first well, I learnt, a lot. I learnt a lot from being... Um, actually, to be perfectly frank with you, I, I, I really paid a lot of attention to what was applied to instruments in the early, early records, like the sort of echoes that they would use. When I first started to be a, a studio musician, 90% of the time, 95% of the time, I didn't know what I was going to be going into play. And I was doing three separate locations a day, five days a week. And bit by bit, I was so, I was so established that I was doing film music, jazz sessions, folk sessions, jingles, rock and roll, in bands, backing singers, that you know, solo singers. And I was doing this whole area of work, but I was getting more and more and more contained and disciplined, which was good, it was a good apprenticeship, but I needed to break out and it was stifling me. And one day I went into a session and it was a Muzak session. You know what Muzak is? Right. And that was it, I thought, I've got to get out of this. <laughs> and, and I did. That's something which which lends itself more to uh, a classical composer like Christoph Pendere Penderecki or Penderecki more than rock and roll. But it's it's the way that I'd, I'd heard that sort of thing. I heard a piece of his called Hiroshima, uh, Ode to the Victims of Hiroshima. And uh, that was the sort of thing. I wasn't emulating exactly what he did, but the spirit of that, I was doing that on the bow and attempting to make quite serious music on it, you know, uh, as much as I was, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, inspired by rockabilly blues and rock and roll. <laughs> And that's a very early example of what we did. <clears throat> but it went on to get really, I mean, I suppose the rain song or Stairway to Heaven are kind of indications of dynamic. Stairway to Heaven was um, a number of sections of music that I had that I wanted to put together because 
during the days that John Paul Jones was a session musician, and I can speak for him here, normally I won't, but I could, and when I was a, a studio musician, the one thing you didn't do was to speed up. You did not. I mean, because if you sped up, you know, you, 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 they wouldn't, you wouldn't be seen again because you had to have this sort of metre of all playing together. And I had, I had an idea that I wanted to have this sort of piece of music that started with like quite a fragile guitar, you know, very, very plaintive. And, and that as it would progress through the song, it would actually sort of speed up and go through these changes. So it actually almost like reaches a climax, okay? Just like making love, you know what I mean? It's like sex, really. After a while, you know what's going on. It could get boring. So that, that was that side of it. And I, and I had these sections that I put together and we routined it because it's quite tricky to get together because, of course, I was starting it on the acoustic and it was intended to go to electric. So there was sort of changes of instruments. It's a bit tricky to get together. I remember that when we were routining it with the three of us, Robert was sitting on the wall by the, in, in the, the rehearsal room and he was, I, I remember him, he was sort of writing his book and all of a sudden he got up and he started to sing on one of the rehearsals and he had a good 80% of the lyrics and the melody and all of that. There's a lady in shoe All the glitters is gold And she's buying the stairway to heaven And when she gets there she knows If the stars are all closed With a word she can get what she came for She's buying a stairway to heaven There's a sign on the wall But she wants to be sure Cause you know sometimes words have two meanings In a tree by the brook There's a strong bird who sings Sometimes all of our thoughts are misgiven Yes, indeed it's, it's kind of a Led Zeppelin sampler, isn't it? <laughs> it has everything that we do. It starts off quietly with the acoustic instruments. Then the rock and roll starts. Oh Good. And the whole, the, the mystical lyrics, you know, that nobody's quite sure what they mean, including Robert. <laughs> Robert Clon doesn't seem to, to like it. No, he doesn't. I don't know why. <laughs> maybe, maybe he knows what the lyrics mean and doesn't like the lyrics. I don't know why. I think it's good. You know, maybe he feels he's sung it too often. I, I'm, I'm not sure. It's an emotive song. And my lyrical in, in, input I think was valid for me as a man in 1972 when I was 24, but I'm 54. And I don't really, some songs I can relate to, they, they, they will live for me forever. From a musical point of view, the song is excellent. And in looking at it in isolation, it is a great piece of music f within its own genre. But for me as a guy, and for a guy who's a contributor and a musical, you know, um, <clears throat> partner in a lot of other work with those guys, I think there are other songs which give me much more of a kick. I knew that it was really good because, I, you know, it just was. You could feel it. I mean, it's like the solo. People go on about the solo. And I, I remember that, I, that it was done in three takes at it, and it was just like the one solo was up.
But I mean, as a singer, it's very difficult to keep an interest for 15 minutes. There's something to do during long instrumental breaks. And I really was studying it and listening to it. And occasionally, vocally, I could join in. But most of the time, I was trying to remember my um, Welsh vocabulary from college. I was doing a course in Welsh history and, and Welsh language. But the sounds going... And I was going, oh, yeah, I remember now. I mean, it was like, sometimes I did get a little bit sort of... I mean, singers are a strange breed, and uh, musicians generally don't have too much to do with singers. I mean, you ask Rod Stewart, you know, it's like... And as a singer, in the middle of all that, sometimes I was, like, transfixed. I thought, how the, how the hell do I actually get back into this? Where do I enter this song? You know, it's a bit like diving into a pool, you know, and there's boats everywhere. the legends, the rumors about like the Led Zeppelin who goes completely mad, they drive motorcycle in the Hyatt Hotel and they... It's only a little one. Rest. <laughs> that, like that. A collapsible motorbike. <clears throat> you have a few parties and they remind you of it in 30 years time, I mean... You know. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... People got nothing else to talk about. <laughs> but come on, a few well, parties didn't... John Bonham come to your hotel room door once and he was taking a, a big sword and smashed the door and dragged you out of bed and left you in the hotel. Maybe. Maybe he did. But does that make him any less of a drummer? wonderful to be able to do concerts but it had a toll if you can imagine doing a concert like that for three and a half hours and, and the the way that the adrenaline taps are just flooding and um, you know at the end of it you can't turn off and so consequently as a tour went on you got more and more sort of not quite neurotic but not really quite yourself you know you became into another realm. Uh, a lot of energy to, ex to explore. You've got to wind down somehow and sometimes we wound down noisier than others. I was standing in a palm tree in Beverly Hills on the night of Bonzo's birthday one year and I think it was Keith Moon and John Bonham arrived together in a car. There were absurdities developing around the pool. George Harrison karate chopped Bonzo's wedding cake, uh, birthday cake 
as Bonzo was showing him what we'd created for him, he was so proud of it, and he was so proud to be meeting George again. And when George brought his hand right through the cake, Bonzo was so angry that the next thing was that George, with the cake, had to go into the swimming pool. But George hung on to a grand piano, to the leg of a piano. So as he was being pulled towards the pool, so was the piano. It was one of those moments while I'm standing in a tree proclaiming that I am the golden god because it was one of those moments where there were shards of energy flying off everywhere and it was only too appropriate that I said something utterly stupid to go with it all. I mean, it was very funny. The piano didn't make it to the pool, but George did. <laughs> Good times and bad times, and drugs came in to some members in the band. How did you struggle with that? Well, nobody knew that much about managing them, as it were, in those days. You know, it wasn't the age of therapy or <laughs> rehab. <laughs> that came 20 years too late for us. But uh, as long as it didn't interfere with, with the music and with stage work, it was kept off stage, I suppose. Well, it was terrible. It was a terrible shock. Um, we knew immediately that it, that was the end of the Zeppelin. When we lost John Bonham under those circumstances, it would, the loss was immeasurable. Apart from the fact that I lost a, a, you know, a very, very dear friend, I really knew what what the the, the world of music had lost as a, a as a force. You know, because he was just an amazing. Drummers, we all know, you know, no doubt about it. John Bonham wasn't the drummer of Led Zeppelin, he was a quarter of Led Zeppelin. And um, yeah. you couldn't just say, oh, get another drummer. You know what I mean? A, you would never find anybody like him, but B, it wouldn't be the same band in the slightest. A percussionist and drummerist John Bonham. I remember him like I saw him yesterday, really. Yeah, I remember his kindness and his humour and also his fury and his love of his family and his skill and his, his beauty as a, as a dear heart. And his confusion with what he was and what he did the fact that he was a brilliant musician but he didn't really want to be sometimes he didn't really want to be doing it at all and yet he wanted to play the drums you know it was like maybe he could have joined a dance band in the Midlands in England and just played a Buddy Rich show because he was so phenomenal and his family are very proud but there's a big hole where he used to be huge possible for you to to play again together who, who knows who knows maybe but it wouldn't be Led Zeppelin I don't see how these songs could live like that without him because his contribution live and in the studio is so so committed and it was his his indications of turning left or right musically that really 
um, often created a rhythm track that let the songs fly. It's a lot different to how the majority of music is created these days. It wasn't a song-based band. The, um, the way uh, the music was created was um, sort of on a, on a continual basis and on stage it was there's a lot of improvisation and uh, but even in the studio the way it was played was what it was about best part of it was that because we you know we were really honest with the music that we were doing and we weren't trying to say crib or lean on something that we'd done on the album before so everyone would know we were we were just making radical departures like that because it seemed the obvious thing and the right thing to do and so we were able to do that without, because we'd, you know, we were our, at least we were our own masters in that respect. We weren't beholding to the record company saying, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, which now bands have to do, unfortunately, for them. But, you know, we had that freedom. Well, I only look back at it now as a voyeur. I mean, I'm looking like you are in a way. And the, and the most remarkable phenomena of the whole thing was that I look at it and go, Oh, oh, um, that's me. I was there. Way down inside. Woman, you need you. And she 